good morning, folks. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, I mean this morning. I'm pleased to be your guide for today's exciting trip into the Pine Barrens. Uh, one thing Margaret didn't mention, you should know that I'm not a botanist or a scientist of any kind. I'm just a hobbyist, but I've been doing this for a long time and I know where to find some really neat stuff. We'll be assisted by my wife, Amy, who's a third generation partner in her family's flower and nursery business. More relevant today, however, she's an outstanding spotter of birds and flowers. She'll help us find some obscure little things to photograph. Oh, wait a minute, that won't work. We're not really there, are we? It's a shame we're hamstrung by the virus. I hope you're all staying safe and keeping active in your gardens. If you're like us, your neighborhood never looks so good. We won't experience the Pine Barrens up close and personal, but there is some good news. I promise you won't get chiggers or ticks, and you won't have to kneel in the mud to view small flowers. In fact, through the magic of macro photography, you'll see some close-up images that we really don't see in the field. We're going to try to recreate a tour that we would have done, and we've done it many times for various groups and researchers. I hope to pique all your senses virtually, of course, because the sight, sound, smells, even taste of the Pine Barrens are quite special. The downside is we have to cram a six hour tour into one hour, and that hour is really already gone, so it's gonna be a two hour event. On a real tour, you'd have to rely on me to lead you out of the forest. Today, you can come and go at will, but I hope you'll find this interesting enough to stick it out with us. I should tell you that I don't typically use a script, there might be a few pauses, misstatements, or tangents. My apologies for that. Most of those are from our personal archives. Six were stolen from the internet. They're attributed to the photographer in the lower left-hand corner. Three were taken by friends who we'll mention later. All of our photos are taken in the wild without the use of lights, backdrops, or props. We don't touch the flowers. Everything is natural. And I promise no plants were harmed during the making of this presentation. So let's get going. First, a little background information before we head into the forest. Where are the Pine Barrens? Many of you have been there. Um, you can see, I'm sure you're all familiar with New Jersey. And historically, the bottom, the southern half of New Jersey was Pine Barrens. How did it get the name? Well, back in colonial times when settlers came from Europe and England and so on, uh, they brought with them the trappings of their daily life, their tools, their livestock, and their crops. And they tried to do what they did at home. So they planted their crops and nothing grew, or at least not very well. Uh, they determined that the land was barren and it wasn't good for agriculture or gardening. So they, they called it the, the barren pines or pine barrens. <clears throat> and you'll see that we talk about the pine lands and use the terms interchangeably. What happened was in the 1960s, a group of folks with more money than brains decided to build an airport in the Pine Barrens. It was to be larger than JFK and Philadelphia combined, and it would have obliterated 50 square miles of the Pine Barrens. Fortunately, another group of folks who had more brains than money squelched the idea. And in the process, they established an organization called the Pine Barrens Commission, which still exists today it's not, um, uh, doesn't have total control over the area, but it has a lot of influence. And when they established that commission, the area outlined in the map is the area that is today the, the Pinelands National Reserve. So you'll hear me use Pinelands or Pine Barrens, and, uh, and that's the reason why. The blue area we'll talk about in a minute, that represents the underground aquifer. So what's so special about the Pinelands? We're gonna talk about the things that make it unique or special, uh, starting with the geology. Geology is the Earth's physical structure and substance, what, what it's made out of, the, the ground, the rocks, what you walk on when you walk around outside. How did it get there? What ancient natural forces changed it over time? For example, tectonic shift, volcanoes, earthquakes, glaciers, and what things continue to affect it today? In the case of the Pine Barrens, the primary geological influences were glaciers and corresponding sea level change. When the glaciers were at their peak, the ocean level receded a bit. 
So there were four major glacial advances which reached New Jersey, creating tundra-like conditions in the north, North Jersey, that is. At times, lower sea levels put the coastline approximately a mile east of where it is today. And we were left with this low, when I say low, I'm talking barely 100 feet above sea level, flat plain that exceeds 2,000 square miles, and that is the Pine Barrens. It's comprised of sand, specifically quartz, had little or no organic matter to support plant growth, and of course it had instant drainage. This picture is a highly magnified image of sand. It looks like rocks or stones, but it's the same sand that runs through your toes on the beach. And this is what we find throughout the Pine Barrens. Hydrology considers the properties of the Earth's water and the movement of that water as it relates to the land. The blue overlay on the previous map outlines a major aquifer called the Kirkwood Cohansey system. It's been estimated that the amount of water which flows through that system underground in one day could supply all of New York City's fresh water needs for a year. That's staggering to think about. The water is very close to the surface. In places, it's only two feet below ground. So it's quite accessible, but it's easily contaminated by human activity. In the late 1800s, a guy by the name of Joseph Wharton, an entrepreneur and philanthropist, purchased massive tracts of land in this area. His idea was to extract the groundwater and sell it to Philadelphia. Fortunately, the New Jersey State squelched that project. All the water in the Pine Lands and that which flows from it via nine major rivers and creeks originates underground. There's no infiltration from outside the area. There are no mountain streams or nearby rivers that bring water into the Pine Lands. Most of the drainage flows eastward to the Atlantic and some goes west to the Delaware River, particularly by way of the Rancocas Creek. And what you see here uh, is an indication of the water in the Barrens. The top picture is one of the rivers. Uh, they're narrow, they're shallow, and they're very slow flowing. The, the pitch from here to the ocean is only a few miles, maybe 10 miles, and it's very gradual. So there's no rapids for the canoe and kayak folks, but it's a very pleasant day on a canoe on, on a river. The lower picture is actually a place we're going to visit shortly. It's one of the savannas that is adjacent to the rivers. Uh, the river has usually Atlantic white cedar along the borders, and then beyond that are savannas, and then going further away from the creeks and rivers, you get into the oak barrens and it rises, the elevation rises just a little bit. Habitat is, of course, something that establishes uh, plant life. Um, the New Jersey pine lands habitats are limited. You have the creeks, you have the uh, Atlantic white cedar swamps adjacent to the creeks, you have these sphagnum bogs and savannas next to that, and then you have what's called lowland forest, where the water table is only about two feet below ground, and the upland forest, which uh, go up to about um, 10 feet in elevation, and the water is a little bit lower, about eight feet below ground. Um, the upland and lowland forest are slightly different in terms of the vegetation, and of course the other habitats are quite different and very unique. So let's talk about vegetation. Uh, the upper picture is, a, is an aerial, which I guess somebody took with a drone. Um, this guy, Christopher Smith, I don't know who that is. But you can see one of the rivers, and along the river is uh, uh, what I would love to find. I don't know where that picture is. But that open area, the tannish area, has got to be loaded with orchids and, and insectivores and, and other interesting plants. And then the forest is adjacent to that. And the lower picture shows uh, one of the savannas that I used to visit frequently at Martha's Furnace. It's getting quite overgrown and changing dramatically. The dominant species of trees in the forest, uh, the upland forest, are pitch pine and a variety of oaks. And as you get closer to the water, red maple, black gum, and swamp magnolia. And Close to the creeks in the cedar bogs, you have Atlantic white cedar, 
which is uh, not an endangered species, but it's not very common and it's limited to specific habitats. So it's a species of concern. Understory plants in the forest are typically scrub oak of several varieties. Uh, vaccinium, that's the blueberries. Uh, there are several species of blueberry. And actually, uh, the, the uh, cranberry is a vaccinium species, believe it or not. There are two species of calmia, uh, several ilex, plethora, uh, leatherleaf, and, uh, and bayberry. And the ground covers are interesting. A lot of lichens, a lot of mosses, and fungi, black fern, and several heath species. And the heath species are acid lovers, so there's quite a few uh, in this area. And then we have sphagnum moss, which is an extremely unique plant. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. The geology and hydrology of the area and the habitats create what might be compared, or I'd like to compare it to the physical structure of a house. They determine what can grow in a place. That vegetation then is like the interior decorating, which in turn influences what animal life thrives there. So the pine barrens have several microhabitats, which make it unique. There are a few other examples of pine barrens on Long Island, Cape Cod, and smaller sites in New England, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. But this is clearly the largest. Because of its latitude and glacial origin, it harbors some things that are at their northern limit, as well as others that are at their southern limit. It harbors an interesting assemblage of plants and animals, uh, including some endemic and near endemic species. Fire is an often disparaged uh, occurrence in forest. Uh, it's a scourge in some people's mind, like Smokey the Bear. But when considering habitat preservation and maintenance, it's a necessity. Think about the Midwestern prairies that are burned to retain uh, or maintain prairie habitat. Historically, forest fires started by lightning raged across the barrens unchecked. The Native Americans utilized fire to manage game. Without fire, the pine barrens would cease to exist. Natural succession would replace the pines with deciduous trees and everything would change. Today, controlled burns are used to preserve this unique habitat. So let's get going. Here we are in the parking lot of the ranger station on Route 206 in Atzion. Uh, you should have been cautioned to wear long pants and long sleeves, bring sun hats, wear something water reproof or, or old sneakers that you don't mind getting wet, and um, bring bug spray along. <clears throat> Keep your eyes and ears open. As we get ready, we're going to consolidate into three cars. I think we can all fit, and we want SUVs that have higher clearance because uh, the roads are a little bit treacherous. The bluebirds have just fled, so we might see some bluebirds along the fence or in the shrubbery along the edge of this parking lot. We're going to make a quick stop at the exquisite Forest Service porta potty. The uh, next opportunity is three hours away, so plan accordingly. Here we go. This is uh, Pine Barrens Interstate Number One, heading south into the Wharton State Forest. And we know it's an interstate because there's enough clearance that your car doesn't bump into the vegetation. We're going to end up on some roads that uh, uh, the underbrush comes right up and scrapes the car. We were there Tuesday and we cut some of that, so hopefully we won't have uh, too much of an issue. First stop we're going to make is about a half a mile in and we see a pond on the left side. It's not our natural pond. It was a water storage um, basin for the cranberry industry. Um, it's now out of use and it's overgrown and it's really quite attractive with a lot of water lilies and yellow pond lily, um, some grasses and sedges and uh, pickerel weed and lots of other flowers. And if we keep our eyes and ears open, you all hear that? Whenever you have a nice pond, you find a family of green herons have moved in. So this is uh, one of the things we see occasionally in the water area, watery areas of the pine barrens. Also a lot of uh, aquatic insects, a number of different uh, 
dragonfly species. This is a brown spotted yellow wing. And listen up, I hear something. That's something we're going to find down the road here a little bit. And there it is, a prairie warbler. One of the uh, unique denizens of this kind of habitat. This area was cut over uh, a number of years ago and it's growing back and the low vegetation is perfect for this bird. And take notice of the pink in the background. That's Calmia latifolia, the, uh, uh, one of the uh, Calmias that we find here. Uh, mountain laurel by its common name. And if you do nothing else and take nothing else away from this trip, plan a visit to the Pine Barrens and come down this main road in May and witness thousands and thousands of, of Calmia in bloom. When the sun shines on it, it sparkles. It's just absolutely magnificent. And in this area where it's open and sandy, we find some of our native flowers. This is one of the lobelias. I'm sure a lot of you grow lobelia in your gardens to attract hummingbirds, the scarlet lobelia or cardinal flower. And we also have meadow beauty. There are two species, Rexia mariana and Rexia virginica. And you can see from the names, Maryland meadow beauty, Virginia meadow beauty, there's an influence from the south. These plants are at their northern limit and we find them both in, in the pine barrens. And we also find the orange milkweed. And I'm sure some of you grow that. It's gotten uh, great rave reviews for gardens. Um, it uh, doesn't do real well where there's no drainage, so I have a problem with it. But um, if you have good drainage, it is not particular. It grows in really weird places, hard packed, gravelly, sandy soil, uh, including along railroad tracks. So it got the common name Railroad Annie uh, from some local folks. And if you look over to the left, up in that shrubbery, you'll see a little flock of cedar waxwing. Uh, who can recognize the plant? This is serviceberry, uh, shadbush sometimes called. It's Amalica canadensis. I'm sure some of you grow that. It's a very popular landscape plant, uh, particularly in more recent years. It's native to this area. Uh, in addition to the beautiful spring flowers and the orangey yellow fall foliage, uh, it, it has berries that attract lots of birds, including the cedar wax one. We're going to stop at the first bog, and I want you to understand that uh, this is not going to be like a walk in the park. It's not like Longwood Gardens or Morris Arboretum or Mount Cuba. Uh, there are some things that, that are a little bit uh, uh, discomforting, to say the least. Uh, there's an opportunity to get stuck in a bog uh, and some of the things we want to watch out for you'll see here um, We didn't see any mosquitoes on Tuesday um, There were lots of flies, but not biting flies um, So chiggers and ticks are the biggest issues. So that's what your bug spray is for um, Get that uh, out and ready um, And the other big issue is poison ivy that's all over the place We've never seen a rattlesnake in the Pine Barrens, but we encountered a guy who did and showed us pictures he had just taken. So you got to look up, you got to look down, you got to be aware of your surroundings and uh, be a little bit cautious. So here we are, stopped at our first site. Um, we're going to uh, get your boots on. I have cold water in the car. I brought bamboo walking sticks for you to use. And uh, take a look around as you get yourselves organized. Uh, get your bug spray on, and we're going to see some really cool stuff on this savanna, and then we're going to go into it and see some other things that are unique to the wet areas. <clears throat> One of the things right along the edge uh, is clethra. Uh, we know it as sweet pepper bush. It's also a popular landscape plant. It's native to the area, and it's just starting to open uh, when we were there the other day, um, and the fragrance is almost overpowering. It's not obnoxious. It's very sweet smelling and, and it just overwhelms the forest. It's a terrific plant. I've got another good garden plant, actually, another good garden plant. 
but it likes better drainage than we have, so we struggle with it also. Keep your eyes and ears open all the time. What's that we hear? Two flycatchers. The first bird that went pee-a-wee, that's the eastern wood pee-wee. And the raucous noise is his cousin, the crested flycatcher. We have other flycatchers, Phoebes, older flycatchers, and that alone gives you some indication of the insect life around the area. Look down also. Here's the forest floor, a typical scene. You see the pine needles, lots of moss, uh, also some uh, prostrate plants, in this case, the Galtheria. And I'm going to pick some of these berries for you, crush it or scratch it with your fingernail and smell it. Uh, in fact, taste them, put it on the tip of your tongue and taste it. You should recognize it. And if anybody remembers Clark's tea berry gum, you're too old to be out alone at night. So keep that in mind. Lots of lichens. Uh, this is the most uh, interesting looking to me, quite, quite gaudy looking. Those stalks are only about a quarter of an inch tall and the red cap, uh, which reminds me of folks of British soldiers, I don't know why, but uh, that's what it's called. Uh, that's only about an inch of an inch across. Quite photogenic. And I mentioned lots of uh, fungi on the forest floor. Here's a beautiful orange mycena. Uh, keep a lookout. The fungus, the fungi are spectacular. There's ones that are velvety black, pure white, absolutely stunning pink colors. There's a blue one. It's, uh, it's remarkable. And this Indian pipe looks like a fungus, but it's not. Believe it or not, that's a flowering plant in the Heath family. It has no leaves, no chlorophyll, so it can't photosynthesize. So it gets its nutrition from the thin layer of decaying vegetation on the forest floor. So that puts it in the general category of mycoheterotrophs, plants that don't produce their own uh, carbohydrate. Another heath, Pepsisua. There are others, there's bearberry, there's spotted wintergreen, low growing flowering uh, heath plants. Now we're gonna go into the bog and across this beautiful savanna. Uh, that's me out there checking things out for you. And the white that you see right above the script, we're gonna see in just a minute close up. But first take one of these bamboo walking sticks and we're gonna make a left-hand turn. Stay single file, don't go straight because that's the big hole that Amy and others fell in. So we're gonna go into the bog. It's a white cedar swamp, white, Cedar swamp area, um, and first thing you'll notice, it's 10 degrees cooler. Uh, the weather service says it's about 92 degrees and 85 percent humidity here, uh, but in the cedar area, uh, the shade and the evaporation of the water from this moss makes it about 10 degrees cooler. You've all seen and used uh, sphagnum moss uh, as a soil amendment or in uh, with potted plants, particularly orchids. And the literature says you don't often see the spores of sphagnum moss. Well, here they are. I got this picture quite by accident. Uh, these spores actually, you can see my pointer there. You see the little cap on these two uh, pops off and the spores uh, disseminate. But it particularly or generally, more importantly, grows um, vegetatively and it just runs in long runners and across the, the, the floor of the forest. Um, it's extremely absorbent. It holds 10 times its weight in water. It's said that the Native Americans used it as, used it as a diapering material for the babies. Uh, it was also used during World War I and a little bit in World War II as a dressing for battle wounds because it's so absorbent and also because it's sterile. Uh, remember, we talked about the acidic conditions here. The water is a pH of uh, three and a half or four which is extremely acidic and it, it retards the growth of uh, bacteria and, and other aquatic life. So right here in this sphagnum moss, we're gonna see our first orchid of the day, Pacanthra clavellata. This plant typically is about four inches tall and it has 
three to four to five, maybe six flowers. This particular example we found a number of years ago, it was absolutely staggering. It was about eight inches tall with 20 flowers. Never saw it or heard of it like that before. This flower, this down in the lower right hand corner here, that's about a quarter of an inch wide. So you wouldn't see it easily. Uh, you're gonna find these today because Amy and I marked a bunch of them with little red flags. So you know, kind of stay single file. We don't wanna compact the moss, but when you see a red flag, you can get uh, a photo of, uh, of this club spur orchid. And then we're gonna leave the sphagnum and cedar bog. And this area here is a continuation of that hole that Amy fell in. So I built a little bridge for you with some fallen cedar trees. So we have to walk across this little bridge. That's what the, uh, the uh, walking sticks are for. And when we get all of everybody across here, we'll start seeing some really cool stuff. Here we go with a blue dance of common blue damselfly. And you can tell damselflies from um, the dragonflies based on the posture of their wings. The damselflies hold their four wings upright and fold it together. The dragonflies hold their wings outspread and you can see all four of them across their body. They also big different in the eyes. Uh, basically, uh, that's, that's the difference. And the, th the next thing that we see that just is staggering and, and blows your mind is the white fringed orchid. This plant's gonna have a big role in today's trip. Um, here we see the first bunch, it, it glistens in the sun, it's snow white, absolutely pure white, it's, it's one of my favorite flowers. And uh, here it is, well, we're gonna see it close up in a, in a few minutes. Uh, right behind the white fringed orchids, there's another little group of cedar trees, and there are a few Turks cap lilies. Seems like an awfully strange place for that, but here they are, and if we watch this one long enough, it'll get a visitor from, uh, get a visit from a butterfly. We're going to walk out into the savanna. It's a totally open area and it's today the water is about three inches deep and that's the reason for your dirty old sneakers or your boots. And the fuzzy white thing we saw in that overall picture when I was walking in the, in the savanna is an endemic, a pine barrens endemic, golden crest. I've never seen such a fuzzy plant. Even the flowers are fuzzy, top and bottom. And you only find this in this kind of habitat. So it's, it's not endangered, but it's, it's rather unique. Another aquatic plant that we see in this area is pipewort. There are several species. It grows in the water, um, but the flower head is composed of kind of like a composite, uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of little individual flowers. And I got out of my belly to take this kind of artsy looking picture from the bottom up. And this particular plant is sometimes cut and dried and used in flower arrangements. Just to show you how small it is, however, take a look at that. This flower head would take, take four or five of them to cover a quarter. And the spider is a crab spider. And this guy has got a problem. He's either colorblind or his color changing mechanism isn't working. It's a chameleon-like spider that matches the color of its, of its background. So he should turn white here. If uh, maybe we leave him alone, he'll, uh, he'll get with the program and he'll, he'll turn white. You've seen these guys in TV commercials. These are a couple of cranberry farmers. And I show you that to introduce cranberries, which in nature grow in sphagnum bogs. And they are low growing vines. I mentioned before, it's a vaccinium species and the vines just run across the ground or the sphagnum moss and the berries are just starting. On Tuesday, we saw a number of large berries, uh, totally green, and they won't ripen and turn red until September. But the flower is attractive and uh, surprisingly, same, same genus as blueberries. Here's another uh, Pine Barrens endemic. And we're looking at these beautiful golden colored things. They look like heads of wheat. Uh, but what that is, is the seed pods. These flowers bloomed in May. And you can see that they're very easily pollinated. Every single flower has a seed pod growing. And the advantage of, uh, of this virtual tour is 
I'm going to show you what it looked like and what you would have seen a few months ago. Isn't that a magnificent plant? And again, a pine barrens endemic. Here we have uh, Sebacea. There are several species. All the others are pink. This is the white one, the lance leaf Sebacea. It is in the gentian family and it's all over the place. Um, if you look around and see white out over the savanna, that's what you're looking at. These are about uh, a couple of feet tall and just, uh, just glistening in the sun. And something else we're gonna find here, uh, if you look low, this is about six inches tall. Um, doesn't look like much here, but this is a seed pod, a single seed pod on a grass-like uh, uh, inflorescence with uh, one, one basal leaf. Well, again, the, the wonder of uh, a virtual tour. This is what you would have seen a couple months ago. Rose pagonia. This is an orchid. This is an orchid person's orchid. It even looks like an orchid. But a lot of our native orchids don't, but here we have one that's uh, quite spectacular. And uh, you can see last year's seed pods that have turned brown and dispersed their seed. Um, but that's what we've got right now is a seed pod of this plant. And here's another seed pod, but this one looks very much like the other. Um, similar grass-like leaf, but it's got three pods. And that tells us this is Calipogon tuberosus, the grass pink orchid. <clears throat> and this has three or more flowers, up to a dozen actually, um, blooms at the same time as the rose pagonia. But today with only the seed pods showing, we can tell which is which by the number of, of pods. If you're real lucky, you'll find a white one. And I've only found that a couple, three times in the pine barrens. Uh, alba form of the grass pink. And now we get into the insectivorous plants. <clears throat> there are um, seven genera uh, in, in North America. Um, these uh, sundews, uh, we have, uh, I think, three in the pine barrens. I know it's three. I'm going to show you the other one in a minute. Round leaf sundew and spatula leaves, obviously named for the shape of the leaf. And you know, I think that these uh, leaves have these little stalks, projections on them. And at the end of the stalks, you see these little glistening drops of, uh, well, sundew, imagine that. Uh, they're uh, an exudite uh, or uh, something that the plant secretes and it has a sweet attractant to the insects. I can't smell anything, but uh, the insects are attracted to it. They get stuck. And the leaf kind of curls around the insect a little bit and, and dissolves it and absorbs the nitrogen. And you'll notice this has got flower stalks starting to rise up out of the plant. And an interesting point to make about the flowers, I mean, obviously the flowering plant, and many flowering plants have leaves that are, you know, down, I mean, have flowers that are down among the leaves. Um, the sundews very noticeably have a long or tall flower spike that rises way above the leaves. And that takes a lot of energy and you wonder why the plant does that. Well, the, uh, uh, the reason evolutionary wise is that if the flowers were down here amongst the leaves, the plant would trap and eat its own pollinators. And that wouldn't be so good for its continued uh, survival. So it goes to the trouble of putting flowers way up above where pollinators don't get stuck. Here's the third example of uh, Drosera, the sundews, in the pine barrens. This one's really cool. These leaves are up to uh, maybe eight to 10 inches tall. And again, it has a flower spike and it's in bloom today. Lots of them. And you can see them uh, you know, from across the savanna. Beautiful pink flower. They're only about uh, a little over a quarter of an inch wide, but um, quite spectacular looking uh, to my mind. And the leaves are, are fabulous. We also have uh, one of the pitcher plants. This is the only pitcher plant native uh, to this area. There are others in the southeast, but uh, this one uh, is found uh, uh, in the Carolinas and northward up into Canada. And you know about pitcher plants. Uh, the leaf is filled with water. It has downward projecting hairs. So an in insect is attracted to this uh, uh, water. It falls in, tries to climb up and get out. It can't because of the downward projecting hairs and it's stuck in the water and it gets absorbed and the plant gets its nutrition. 
keep in mind these uh, insectivorous plants um, are in an environment that we talked about being acidic and fairly sterile, not a whole lot of organic matter. Um, so they've taken uh, things into their own hands and they, uh, they digest insects. Has a beautiful flower, um, terrific deep purple color, wine color, and it fades slightly as it matures. And this is what it looks like uh, in a couple of weeks. Really a spectacular looking plant. And then we have Utricularia, the uh, bladder warts. This group of plants is about 150 worldwide. There are seven in the Pine Barrens. Uh, and what you see on the surface of the water is this mat of the floating leaves and the flower spike projects upward out of the water. This particular one is swollen bladder wart. Um, it's the most common. We also have horned bladder wart, which I think is really a cool looking flower, and that's reasonably abundant. And then we have the purple bladder wart, which I've only seen in one spot, and we're not going there today, but I wanted to show you that uh, anyway. And then on the left hand side, these six spoke-like projections coming out of this plant are actually the leaves floating on the surface. And in the water coming off the leaves, these little fibrous uh, uh, projections that have little bladders, really tiny uh, bladders on them. And they have the capability of compressing and squeezing out the moisture that's in them. And then they relax, open up, and they suck water in. And in the process, they suck in what uh, little microscopic organisms might be there and uh, that's how they get their uh, their sustenance, their, their nutrition. And we're across the bog or the savanna now into another little sphagnum and cedar bog or swamp and we're going to find this beautiful gold crested orchid. Um, these are very large specimens. I've marked these also with the, um, the red flags uh, so you don't step on them and they can, can find them easily and, and take a picture. Uh, interestingly enough, this has a yellow form. So we have both right here, uh, fairly close to each other. And um, it, it's, a, it's a generally small plant with, um, oh, I'm going to say uh, a dozen or so flowers. This is a particularly large specimen. And somebody wrote to me and said, they saw orchids in a ditch in Bethany Beach. That was Julia said that. And I suspect it was this plant. If not, it was a, uh, uh, it was a spiranthes in the fall. We'll talk about that when we get to talk to Julia. <clears throat> okay. We are going to move on. We're gonna go back out of this savanna work our way back across the way we came. Please take the red flags with you so we don't leave them for uh, people to get attracted to and step on the plants. And we're going to go back through the original sphagnum bog out to the car and down the road about two miles to a spot where there is no parking, but we're going to get our three cars sort of aside the road so another car could get by if it happened to come by. And we're in a dry, uh, oak forest now, about 10 feet elevation. And when you get out of the cars, look around, look up, look down. Uh, here we find some blueberries, they're beginning to ripen. I encourage you to taste them. Very sweet and um, very seedy, but, uh, and they're warm, but they're, they're, they're terrific. They're just really, really, really good. And I wanna tell you a brief story about blueberry cultivation. In 1910, a lady named Elizabeth White got into blueberry cultivation for whatever reason, personal reasons, and she hooked up with a guy, a scientist from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who was also working on blueberry cultivation. And so Elizabeth went out in the Pine Barrens, identified blueberry plants that were especially robust, had the biggest, largest, uh, sweetest blueberries, and she transplanted those to her property. And she started hybridizing, cross-pollinating, uh, making cuttings, and growing blueberry plants that were sure to yield, uh, you know, an attractive crop for commercial use. Um, her property has a bog on it, and today uh, it's called White's Bog, and we go there occasionally to see some interesting um, Pine Barrens plants. 
but that's the beginning of blueberry culture in the United States. And as I mentioned, stay alert, listen. Right over the blueberry bushes, there he is. That's a little guy, and very noisy for such a little guy. The white-eyed vireo. And look down at the same time you're looking up, if you can do that. Here we find some really interesting, very pretty green leaves. They're extremely pubescent, fuzzy. Um, we saw them on Tuesday. No flowers. Some of you should recognize this. And again, because of uh, the virtual nature of this tour, I'm going to show you what we would have seen, what we would have found uh, back in May. I'm sure many of you have seen this plant in the forest somewhere. Some more of the bird life, a number of warblers in this area, uh, great for bird watchers, particularly in the spring during migration. And now we have descended about 10 feet and we went through another sphagnum bog and we're coming out onto a wide open sunny savanna. And this is one of the most remarkable sites we've ever seen in the way of wildflowers. This is the yellow fringes orchid. I know it's not exactly yellow, it's sort of orange. I call it the ripe mango color. But this plant is, um, it's near and dear to me. It's got to be one of my favorites for a variety of reasons. Uh, not the least of which, it's just a beautiful flower, but also because I spent probably 10 years trying to find it the first time. <clears throat> this particular area, is the only place, the only place left in New Jersey where you can find this flower, this little tiny bog, less than an acre. It used to grow from South Jersey down the coast all the way to Georgia and around the Horn, uh, across the Florida Panhandle, along the Gulf Coast to Texas. It's no longer found in Texas or Louisiana. I'm not sure about Mississippi, uh, but Alabama, Georgia, uh, and the Carolinas no longer found in Maryland, Delaware, or Virginia. So this is now a disjunct outlier population. Um, there were three locations in the Jersey Pine Barrens. The first place that I found it is now a sand quarry. The second place that I heard about, I never could find. So I'm not sure that, that, I'm not sure that exists. So this is it. And I don't take many people here. Um, I'm concerned about poaching or uh, compaction, but uh, generally every year you find about a dozen to 20 flowers in bloom and they're just starting now. We saw one on Tuesday with one flower open. Um, so today there are a few more, I'm sure. Um, some years, and it depends on weather, we get 40 or 50 flowers. A number of years ago we came in here and my jaw dropped. There were 120 blooming Latanthera integra. Absolutely unheard of, absolutely spectacular. And what's so special about the plant? Well, first of all, look at this. It's minuscule. It's absolutely tiny. Here's a scene that Amy found for me a couple of years ago. And I wrote an article for Orchids Magazine about my quest to find this plant and then the uh, happenstance of uh, finding this particular location, which I didn't identify other than to say that it's in New Jersey. And this picture with the praying mantis was the cover photo of that magazine. And that's the first and only time they put anything on the cover besides an orchid. So that was sort of interesting. Um, again, uh, a long, years long quest to find it, a very special rare plant, and it is just fantastically beautiful in my opinion. If you look to the left, down at the lower end of the bog, you can see uh, an outlet. This is when, when the water level is high and the water exits the bog, it goes out between these trees. It's only a couple inches deep now, but you can see the tea color of the water. All the water in the Pine Barrens bogs and rivers is stained this color. Two reasons. One, uh, there is iron 
in the substrate. Not very good quality iron, even though it was used to, to make cannonballs and cannons during the revolution. Um, there is some iron that leaches out from the acidic water and it appears on the surface or in the water as this tea color. In addition, tannin from the cedars uh, is leached out and helps to stain the water and lower its pH. That water is pure. You could actually drink it if you were so inclined. But remember, I've got cold water back in the car. Well, looky, looky here. Look what Amy found for us. This is another Pine Barrens endemic. Uh, it does grow uh, here at its southern limit and it grows north and it can be found in some Canadian provinces, in particular Newfoundland. Uh, it grows in sphagnum bogs and it's really a fern. Doesn't look like it, but look at these curly Q things on the left hand image. Uh, those are the sterile fronds that, that ferns all have. Um, and it just looks like a little curly piece of grass, hence the name. On the right hand side, these taller uh, structures are the, the fertile fronds coming up and you can almost see the, uh, the uh, spore packet starting to form here at the top of these fronds. The brown ones are last year's left over. And what's the big deal about this plant? Well, it's rarity, uh, it's uniqueness and it's size. Look at here. There's one plant appears to be growing out of an old beer can. That is not a beer can. That's my wedding ring. Tiny, tiny plant. How does Amy do it? I have no idea. But she always finds this for us when we come to the Pine Barrens. Around the edge of the bog, we find a polygola. You're familiar with that genus, I suspect. Uh, this is one that's unique to the Pine Barrens. It doesn't look like much when you stand over it. It looks like a big clover head. Not much bigger than the common clover that you have in your lawn. Uh, if you take a close look at it, however, here's where macro photography works its magic. Look at that plant. That's just, that's just an amazing flower in my mind. Uh, the, the plant, the flower, and the stamens and pistils are in the center, and these pink wing things, these looks like a tutu skirt or something, uh, are bracts around the flower. But it, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. As is this purple milkweed. Uh, not common at all. There's only a couple plants I know of in the Pine Barrens. Um, and in fact, we didn't find this one on Tuesday. I'm not sure what happened to it. But uh, milkweeds are a special favorite of ours. We're going to leave this savanna now. And uh, we're going to uh, uh, go back to the ranger station. We're drive out of the Pine Barrens, go back to the uh, Route 206, go north eight miles, go 10 miles east, and we're going to arrive in the thriving metropolis of Chatsworth. On the way out of the savannah, keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, here's the other Calmia species, sheep laurel. It looks just like mountain laurel, except the uh, uh, plants, uh, the leaves are darker and more linear, and the flowers obviously are pink. It's just finishing up. There's only a few blossoms left. But it grows uh, in the lower elevations around the perimeters of the bogs, as does swamp magnolia. Uh, and the swamp magnolia reaches its northern limit here. It's a, it's a southern plant. Obviously, look at the name, Virginiana. We see all kinds of things walking around here, just getting back in the car. Here goes a beautiful scarlet tanager that nests here. And we made our journey and now we are in Chatsworth, the beautiful metropolis of Chatsworth. Chatsworth is a historic settlement in the Pine Barrens. Today, it's a hot dog stand, an abandoned fire station, a historic house that's being converted into a museum, and about 30 residences. That's Chatsworth, <clears throat> plain and simple. We always stop here and get something to eat. So. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here. You can buy hot dogs, you can buy uh, little uh, chips and snacks, candy bar, cold drinks. Uh, we're going to sit a minute and catch our breath. Uh, there is a porta potty. And when you get done eating, if you want to, if you're interested in uh, gathering around the table where I end up sitting, um, I'm going to dissect a couple of orchid blossoms that I brought from home, larger flowers, to show you 
the morphology of an orchid and what it is that makes an orchid an orchid. <clears throat> and then we're going to head back uh, to the cars and go south about five miles and uh, see what we can find. This is a paved road, so it's uh, a lot easier to, to negotiate. And look here, a sharp-shinned hawk, an immature, just crossed the road. There he is on the right side, landed in that, uh, that shrub on the right side of the road. This is an immature, you can tell, because the adults have a totally gray head and back. The immatures are kind of mottled and brown. And why are we stopping here? Whoa, look at this, look at this. Remember the white fringed orchid, the first uh, orchid we saw in the first savanna, I should say. Um, this is a remarkable sight. Can't tell from this picture. However, uh, this colony of white fringed orchids is growing right along the road. You could take this picture without getting out of your car. From the gravelly road shoulder to the woods behind is about 10 feet. So this colony is 10 feet front to back and it extends about 60 yards side to side. We counted 600 orchid plants. That's the single largest colony of white fringed orchids that I know of anywhere outside of South Carolina. There's a, a pine savanna where there are that many plants, but not so condensed. And also in Canada where the orchids are quite prolific and close together. Just a spectacular uh, abundance of flowers. It's growing on property that belongs to a cranberry farmer. And he mows it every year. And we finally convinced him, don't mow until after the seeds have dispersed. And he's been very cooperative in that regard and also in letting us enter his property with uh, folks from the Smithsonian, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Here's a close up of this plant. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Just just a spectacular snow white flower. They're about an inch tall and maybe a half an inch wide. And I want you to take note, right in the center of this photograph, my little pointer is circling this little orangey thing. Who knows what that is? That's an orchid pollinia. That's one of the distinguishing features of all orchids. And if you look at the flower above that right here, you can see two pollinia still encased in a, in a little membrane in the orchid. Look at the flower below, same thing. You can see the little pollinia right in there. This is one of my all-time favorite photos for what it shows you besides just a, a beautiful flower. And before we leave this spot, look at the edge of the woods where it's a little bit damp. We've got some button bush and another tiger swallowtail. We saw him before on the uh, Turk's cap lily. And if you want to see what he looks at from above, you probably know this, but there he is on Joe Pie weed. And the Joe Pie is just now opening and it grows around here in the uh, roadsides and sandy open places and, and barren fields. Joe Pie weed is a very popular uh, landscape plant these days. We have a lot of it in our garden and it does very well and it just gets covered with butterflies in another week or so. And speaking of butterflies, you all know the monarch. And here he is on one of the earliest blooming goldenrod species. And I don't know the name of it, but uh, uh, there he is uh, for your viewing pleasure. Oh, and listen, listen up. Another warbler in the bushes behind the, uh, the butterfly. <clears throat> We also find along the sandy roadside another pelagola, uh, the orange milkwort. This one happens to have a yellow form. Not very common, but we find that here occasionally as well. Now we're going to get back in the cars, head south another three miles, and turn left down a narrow paved road. And we're going to um, come to a facility, uh, kind of a rundown building, but it is uh, part of the Rutgers uh, Agricultural Extension. <clears throat> and the scientists there and the uh, horticulturists are there to assist the blueberry and cranberry industry. Um, 
they work on hybridization and pest management and cultivation techniques and so on and, uh, and help the, uh, the farmers. And right near that facility, we find another bog, cranberry bog. And again, it's not an active cranberry growing space. It's a water storage facility that the farmers use when they harvest the cranberries. Um, kind of an oddball looking plant, but the fact that it grows in the water and close up, I think it's quite interesting looking. <clears throat> well, be careful where you step. We don't want to hurt the frogs. Right across the street from that bog, Look at what we find, more white fringed orchids. Nothing comparing to the 600 that we just saw up the road, but 40 or 50 anyway. And um, in amongst them, we find another old friend. Remember the first savannah, we saw the real large specimens of the gold crested orchid. Uh, we had an orange variety or an orange form and a yellow form. Well, this is the same plant. This is a more typical size. It's only about four inches tall. The flower is about a quarter of an inch in either direction. So it's a tiny little thing, but it's growing right in amongst the white fringed orchids, which are maybe 18 to 20 inches tall. And I'm gonna ask you a simple question having to do with, uh, with paint. What happens if you mix white paint and orange paint? Well, it depends how well you mix it. If you don't mix it much, you get an orange creamsicle thing. But if you mix it real well, you probably get yellow. And that's exactly what happened here. These are hybrids of the two previous species, the white fringed orchid and the gold crested orchid. Naturally occurring hybrids. And you can see, uh, and there are reasons I won't get into that are complicated, why I know that's what this is. Uh, but you can see the yellow and the white uh, in this rather typical looking plant. And the one on the left is mind boggling. Margaret saw this very same plant last year. It's just starting to open. On Tuesday, there were a few flowers open down on the bottom, which is where it starts and works its way up. Uh, it's got over 200 flowers on it. Nothing is that big in my experience in, in either of these species. How did that plant get to be so humongous? And Margaret, you'll be happy to know there are three others just like it growing a foot away that were not there last year when we saw this. So how did this occur? Well, here we go. Remember the butterflies? Here's the swallowtail butterfly. Here's the uh, uh, clear wing uh, sphinx moth that you see in your garden. You think it's a hummingbird, uh, but it's not. And remember the little yellow thing in that picture of the white fringed orchid? I mentioned that uh, we saw them actually still embedded in flower. Those are the pollinia. A pollinia is an orchid uh, reproductive structure which consolidates or aggregates all the pollen grains on the stalk of that little, or on the top of that little stalk. Um, and it is removed by a pollinator, in this case a moth, and in this case a butterfly, and it gets stuck to their eyes. They visit another flower, and here he is, the, the pipe vine swallowtail on a gold crested orchid, and he's going to end up trying to uh, get nectar out of that flower, and he'll transfer pollen in the process and, and uh, pollinate it, cross pollinate it. So that's how we got the, the previous slide. We got these uh, fantastic natural hybrids, and it's got its own name, and so on and so forth. I want to point out um, the hummingbird moth was photographed by a friend, Stephan Ams, who's a scientist at uh, NIH. Uh, the butterfly was photographed by a friend, Jim Fowler, from South Carolina. Uh, those of you, uh, we, we brought him here to see this, uh, this phenomenon, and he reciprocated by showing us a rare orchid in Georgia. Uh, but if you are a stamp enthusiast, or don't know anything about stamps, and you could Google this when we're done here, um, the post office just issued a set of native orchid stamps with 10 uh, photographs on them. They're all Jim's photographs. So what are we doing here? This is a group of folks that we brought to this area about a week after Margaret and I were there last year. Uh, the lady in the middle is a postdoctoral fellow from Denmark. Uh, the young fellow is an intern from Smithsonian, 
the old guy is a friend, uh, an orchid grower, but also a, a guy who blames me personally for getting him into native orchids and birds. And he is now working at Mount Cuba uh, as a volunteer in a project to uh, uh, locate and identify and catalog all the native orchids in the state of Delaware. Not shown in the picture is Dr. Melissa McCormick, who is head of the DNA Research Laboratory at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and another doctoral candidate from Chile. So the point here being, there are a lot of scientists from all over the world studying hardy orchids. Um, and what we did here, uh, these folks located some of the white fringed orchids at that 600 plant colony. They tagged the plant by putting a little metal tag in the ground next to it, took GPS coordinates and, uh, and marked it. Um, they then went to, well, the first thing they did, they took DNA samples. This is an actual white fringed orchid. They pulled the sphagnum back and clipped a little one inch long snip of the root, which goes to the Smithsonian to uh, do the DNA research or, or um, DNA sequencing, and also to identify the fungus that's resident in the roots. That's the subject of a whole nother lecture. Um, so I will get into it here. It's very technical, very important in, the, in terms of work of conservation. Uh, they cover the roots back up, the plant's fine. And uh, then we did this. We took the pollen. Remember the pollen grains we saw on the butterfly and the moth? And we saw in that white fringed orchid photo? Here they are. We took the pollen grains from this white plant, drove down the road, and pollinated the yellow plant, the gold plant. And simultaneously, we took pollen grains from the gold plant, we drove back up the road to the white fringed orchids and cross pollinated that. And so how do we deal with this? We got to go back and get the seed. How do we find it? The, the folks put a little pink thread around the specific flower on the flower stalk that they pollinated. And they went back in October and they found that very plant and that very flower with a little pink string and they picked that seed pod and took them to Longwood Gardens. Why Longwood Gardens? Our friend, who is a, a PhD botanist and the head botanist at Longwood Gardens these days, has perfected uh, germinating orchid seed. Orchid seeds are almost microscopic. Here they are greatly enlarged on a dish of agar. Uh, these little things scattered around are individual seeds that you barely see with the naked eye. The big one that looks like a mealybug is a germinated seed. And Peter has discovered the secret to getting those things to grow. He moves them onto a uh, medium. Uh, he puts potatoes in it to get the starch. It's weird. All kinds of weird chemicals and stuff. But here goes one of these germinated seeds. It's sending root down into the agar and it's sending up a, a green structure that's developing chlorophyll and it will become the orchid plant. And what are we doing all this for? Why are these people coming all the way up from Washington and Longwood and wandering around the mosquito infested pine barrens and cutting plants and so on and so forth? It's all conservation related. The intent is to be able to perfect the cultivation of these orchids, at least in the wild, so we can replace uh, these plants in areas where they've been damaged or extirpated for whatever reason, or establish new colonies in suitable habitat, and uh, ultimately, somewhere down the road, maybe make it feasible for people to grow them in their home. Uh, that takes the pressure off the native populations. It also gives us something to do when we're quarantined by a virus and uh, it could be a lot of fun, and it could be financially advantageous to the scientists who developed the technique. So Peter's got these plants growing up, and what we hope is uh, in three years, it may end up looking like this. And thank you for joining us. <laughs>